Welcome, this is the first episode in a short series of tutorials about the new asset pack I just released for Blender. This asset pack is called SDF Nodebox and it contains 45 shader nodes for creating and working with 2D and 3D sign distance fields. If you don't know what an SDF or sign distance field is yet, that's perfectly fine. That's what this video is for. I'm going to be talking about what it is, how I use them, and why they're really cool. I'm going to be trying to do that all right from the basics of exactly what they are. Do note that the later episodes in this series will be using, will be specifically talking about these node groups that, I, that I've included here, uh, but this episode specifically is going to be fairly generic about sign distance fields in general, but I will be using the nodes from this node pack to demonstrate what I'm talking about. This video will be a fairly general introduction to what SDFs are and how you, you can use them. The next video in the series, I'll be going over how to create this crown example as an example of how to combine and work with multiple SDFs to, to create more complex composite shapes with them. In the third episode, we'll be recreating this pattern example in order to go into more details about creating patterns with sign distance fields. In the final planned video, we'll be recreating the sign example here to showcase how you can use SDFs to create fully parametric masks with infinite resolution and how you can use SDFs to add details to more realistic models. So first we need to talk about what an SDF is. An SDF is just simply a function or node group in this case that defines the surface of a shape using math. What does that mean? A function is just something that takes an input and then gives you an output. In this case, an SDF will take in a position as an input and as an output, it will tell you how close to the surface of the shape that it defines that position is. For example, here you can see I've got the node group defining a 2D box with a width of 0.5 and a height of 0.5, and that width of 0.5 will be spread out across both sides of the box. So if I input a shape of 0.25 on the X and zero on the Y and Z, this will give me a position that it should be exactly on the edge of that box. So it'll have a distance of zero because it's exactly on the surface of the box, which we'll put here and we'll get the color black here. But if you watch, as I start to increase the X value here and move this point further to the right, the color of the, the surface here is going to start to increase until I get to what should be 1.25, at which point it becomes fully white because you can't display a color over white and it's got a distance of one. And of course, this will work in the other direction as I lower the value here and then start increasing the Y. After a certain point, when I pass the corner, it's going to start increasing in value as well as the distance is still increasing again. Now, it starts to be a lot more fun if instead of inputting a single position into the SDF node, we input some form of coordinate system. For example, the object coordinates from the texture coordinate node, in which case we get a gradient radiating away from the surface of the shape that the SDF node box defines. The value output here is again the distance. So. This gray to white area here represents increasing values of distance as it is moved further away from the surface of the shape. The black area inside the cube is actually going to be uh, negative values, but you can't display that through shaders, so it just gets clamped at black, so it just, it's just displayed as black. So essentially, an SDF is essentially just a fancy gradient, but that gradient is an incredibly useful and flexible way to define a shape. This can let us do some pretty cool things where you can union multiple shapes into a single SDF using the union node. Because SDFs are just gradients, it also makes it very easy to be able to displace the surface of the shape using various textures. It's also very easy to create an outline of various shapes. Of course, these aren't just a 2D thing either. They work in 3D. All the math still works in 3D as well, although it can be a bit troublesome to view sometimes. So I have also included uh, preview nodes for both 2D for both previewing 2D and 3D SDFs in the pack. Okay, so an SDF is a function that creates a gradient radiating away from the surface of a shape defined using math. But when is that actually useful? When would you use this? SDFs are going to be useful anytime that you're going to be doing any form of procedural texturing. 
It's very nice just to have an asset pack on hand where you can quickly mask out different shapes using these primitive shapes here. There's also quite a few reasons why you might want to procedurally texture something instead of using texture files. One is that these are all defined using masks. So you've got infinite resolution. You can zoom in as far as you want on something and it's never going to look blurry unless you define it to look blurry. It's also more flexible because everything is procedural. Everything here is still editable. I can go in and change the size of this cube here whenever I want. And a big one, I think, is that I can potentially lower your memory memory usage by quite a bit when you're rendering. Sure, procedural textures typically come with a small rendering speed hit when compared to using textures, but over the last few years that has become a better and better trade-off. What I mean by that is that over the last few years graphics cards have started to become ridiculously fast. The 20 series, 30 series, and 40 series cards are all stupid fast. However, the memory increase these cards have seen hasn't really kept up with the speed increase of the cards. So a lot of the times you can be more limited by the memory of your graphics card rather than its speed. Of course, there are ways to get around memory limits like using instancing, rendering in passes and using a level of detail system with geometry nodes or whatever, but they're all kind of a pain to use, except for instancing. You should pretty much always use instancing if you can. But the way I see it is that because memory is usually your most limiting factor, if you can trade a small amount of speed for what could potentially be a not insignificant amount of memory, it's usually worth doing that. And you can do that by using procedural textures instead of texture files. Another use case that I think there might be quite a bit of potential for is motion graphics. This is something that I've only experimented with a little bit, so I'm not sure if there's actually something here or not, but something that I think a lot of people don't know is that you can actually animate the values in shader nodes. It can be a bit cumbersome because you need to have both the object and the node selected in order to have the keyframes show up in the dope sheet or the graph editor. Once you know that, it can be done quite easily. For example, it should be fairly easy to create a quick bouncing ball animation. If I go to the top view, create a 2D circle, add in the infinite plane here, collect the object vector into both of these to a union to join them into a single SDF. Then I'll mask them out to make sure that they're sharp. And if I plug that into the surface, we've got a floor plane and a ball. Move the infinite plane down a little bit make the ball a little bit smaller. And then for an animation, I'll move it on the Y up a little bit and then I can press I to keyframe that. If I switch this over to the dope sheet, you can see we've got the keyframe here. And then what I can do is I'll move it over back to the first frame and then go say 40 frames in the future and bring this down to the point where it's just touching the surface of the plane. Insert another keyframe. And if we play this back now, we can see the ball moves. Now to create a bouncing ball, it's pretty easy, you'll move this back. And from there, I can just change the interpolation type to bounce, and it should create a bouncing ball. And that all works, that's all done using shaders. And there's no vectors that people need to place with, there's no meshes, there's no UV unwrapping, it's just pure math. So I think there's potentially a lot of potential for motion graphics, I just don't know if the workflow of having to do it through nodes and shaders will make that too difficult. That's not worth doing. Now for an example of this being used, I'm going to go over one of the examples that I provide here. I'm going to recreate one of the simpler ones. I'm going to pull out the any sided polygon, change the side count to six. This gives us a hexagon gradient. And again, this is fully changeable. You can change this at whatever you can even animate it, but I'm going to stick with the hexagon right now. And then with only a couple more nodes, we can turn this into a infinite repeating pattern ready to be used as a mask. And for that, I'm going to go into the operations and pull out the repeat infinite, put that in the middle here. And what this repeat infinite is going to do is, you can see it better if I reduce the size here, it's going to create an infinite grid of SDFs. So now to match the settings that I had before, I'm going to change these to one with 0.66 on the X. So then it's slightly less spacing on the X. From there, I'm also going to do a repeat radial with six segments and a starting angle of 30 degrees. Now, if I mute the repeat infinite, I'm actually not going to see anything here because I need to move it off to the side for you to be able to see it because it rotates around the origin. And so if I move it out, you'll see that there are multiple hexagons that are now being radially arrayed. I can increase the segments here and you'll see what the radial array does. I'm just going to keep it at six for the example at 30 degrees. This should be set to one meter at 0.455. And 
90 degrees with Z with a scale of 0.2 here to make it all smaller. And that gives us this nice pattern here with the hexagons all lining up with each other with the sides here with just a little bit of space in between them. If I turn the repeat infinite on again, you'll see that they'll start intersecting with each other to create this interesting pattern here. Where you've got the lines going diagonal with the section in the center. And then from there, it can be easily turned into a mask from this gradient with the single node, which is gonna sharpen everything up into a mask again with infinite resolution. And it's infinitely repeating. And this is made just using four nodes. If you're interested in buying this asset pack, it is available for purchase right now, and I'll put the relevant links in the description. Now, if you're interested in learning more about SDFs and really going into the nitty gritty details of how they work, I highly recommend you go check out Inigo Quillis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I hope I am. His website, he has a bunch of articles on here about how they work. And this is pretty much the go-to site for inf information about sign distance fields. I highly recommend it. And he provides it all under the MIT license.